Good afternoon. My name is Amy McCreeth, and I'm the coordinator of the Technology and Culture Forum at MIT. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's forum, Elections 2004, Did the Media Fail? As you may know, this is the third of a three-part series that the Technology and Culture Forum has co-sponsored with MIT's Communications Forum. And if you were with us in the fall, you know that we had some tremendous presentations, some of which were a little bit scary in terms of the information that they gave us about uh, the trends in how people are getting their information and the influence uh, that the media has uh, and uh, the content of the media as people were preparing for the elections last fall. So today we're doing sort of a post-mortem. We're looking back and seeing what the effect of the media was and the role that it played with a particular eye to its effect on our democratic process and bringing information to citizens so that they could make good choices about how they were going to vote. And we're really thrilled that today we have two tremendous speakers with us to lead this conversation, Terrence Smith and Kathy Young. Each of them is going to be speaking uh, for about 20 minutes and then we'll have lots of time for conversation. So we hope that you'll be thinking of questions that you'd like to ask. We'll have plenty of time for that once they're finished with their presentations. David Thorburn, who is the director of the uh, Comparative Media Studies program at MIT, will be the moderator for that part of our program this afternoon. And once again, let me just say, David, that it's been a great pleasure to work on this series with you. Uh, when it gets to the time for questions, there are, there are two microphones, one on each aisle, and if you could come to the aisle, to the microphones, and ask your question into the microphone, that would be a great help as this event is being audio cast and also videotaped. So let me introduce you to the speakers for our forum today. Terrence Smith joined the NewsHour with Jim Lair in August of 1998. And he was brought there to establish and lead the media unit as its senior producer and correspondent. Terry and his unit are four-time winners of the Arthur C. Rouse Award for Media Criticism given by the National Press Club. Prior to joining PBS, Smith spent 20 years as a national and foreign correspondent and editor with the New York Times and 13 years with CBS News. And as someone who is a devoted watcher of the NewsHour, I want to personally thank him for being here and for his good work. Thank you. Kathy Young is a columnist for the Boston Globe, as many of you know, and a columnist and contributing editor for Reason magazine. Her articles have appeared in a variety of publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. Born in Moscow, she's lived in the United States since 1980. She's the author of two books, Growing Up in Moscow, Memories of a Soviet Girlhood, and Ceasefire, Why Women and Men Must Join Forces to Achieve True Equality. As I mentioned to Kathy in the last few days, several people told me that they noticed that she'd be with us tonight. And they told me, oh, I always read her column. And a few of them said, sometimes I really disagree with her. And sometimes I really agree with her, but I always read her column. And I think that's actually a sign of great respect uh, and a good sign that a journalist is getting people to think and that people read her even when they don't agree with her. So we're really glad that you're with us today. So now let me turn the program over to David Thorburn. And thanks again to our speakers for being with us. Are there two, two, uh, is this on? Uh, there are two minor corrections. One is uh, Henry Jenkins will be happy to learn that I am not the director of the Comparative Media <laughs> Studies program, but the director, but the director of the MIT Communications Forum and a, and a uh, uh, faculty member in Comparative Media Studies. Uh, the, the second correction, more serious, uh, uh, and uh, I want to encourage our speakers to think in these terms. We're going to be talking not just about the election, but about its aftermath and the coverage of the uh, of the. Uh, presidency and the White House and American politics in the period after the election as well because uh, when I uh, invited uh, Terry Smith to come and talk here his first reaction was oh that's old news the election we, what about what's happening now and it seemed like a helpful 
correction. So uh, I hope not only that the speakers will take up such matters, but that, but that uh, you in the audience will not hesitate to raise questions about the relation between our media and our politics as it is being played out today as well. Uh, which of you is going first? I will. Okay. Uh, Shall I? Yep. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I uh, uh, came here this afternoon from um, Hollywood on the Potomac, that uh, the true entertainment capital of America. Uh, and as I uh, as I uh, was in a cab coming from Logan, I heard that uh, um, Nicholas Negroponte's brother John currently the U.S. ambassador in Baghdad, will um, uh, be nominated to be the new and first director of National Intelligence Director or Intelligence Czar. And I, uh, John is an old friend of mine. I've known him for 30 years, and I thought to myself, hmm, Baghdad may look good after uh, a month or two of... Uh, Washington in that job, it's a very interesting selection, not, not from the pure intelligence community. And, and uh, we'll see uh, first, of course, how he fares going through um, uh, approval, the approval process. But um, David, taking your, your admonition about uh, the election and now, um, let's, let's talk a little bit about the election and, and, and what I see anyway as the highs and the lows of the media coverage of what was without question one of, I think, one of the most interesting, closely fought, uh, intensively covered elections of, of any of our lives, uh, our time. It also produced the highest turnout in, in uh, two decades. So it clearly got people's attention. <clears throat> I thought that among the highs, in the coverage, that there was a lot of good work done, uh, most of it uh, in print, not exclusively, um, that work that profiled the candidates, that dissected their positions and, and uh, challenged their accuracy in their television advertisements and statements, that uh, pointed up the inconsistencies in their stump appearances, and all in all, there was actually a great deal of uh, very good work, a lot of it done in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, the predictable so-called mainstream media, including uh, USA Today. And yes, I do mean USA Today. Um, they did a lot of very good uh, coverage. Um, I think there was good work done as well on television. Frontline, once again, did its excellent in-depth portraits of the, of the two uh, candidates in the general election, and I think you can learn a lot by watching those. Um, I believe the news hour, where, as we say, we dare to be dull, we, um, uh, we, we looked uh, hard at the candidates and many of the issues that arose. We developed a fact check segments on the truth of what they were saying on the road and ad watch segments about the truth or falsity of what they were saying on the air in their paid uh, in their paid commercials. I think there was actually a lot of good discussion in the great welter of talk on on the all news cable networks. It it was unfortunately very heavily mixed with opinion and I think People can be forgiven if sometimes they find it a little sort, a little hard to sort out one from the other. But in fact, there was a great deal of very interesting commentary. Probably the most interesting coverage and and the most uh, that which was different in 2004, even from 2000, was the attention paid and coverage provided on the internet. Um, it it uh, came of age in at least two respects. One as a fundraising vehicle, no, the like of it never seen before. And you know it has 
created the template now for uh, campaign fundraising in the future, and maybe beyond campaigns, but just sticking for the moment with a campaign. So it, is, it, it was long promised as an effective vehicle to do that. It really delivered this time, uh, raising hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for the campaign, mainly for Democrats. Um, and I think you'll see the Republican Party catch up in a big way. Uh, you already did towards the end of the campaign, but I think you'll see it in the, in the coming years uh, pretty dramatically. But more importantly, as a source of news and, again, of fact-checking and uh, double-checking of what was being said not only by the candidates, by the campaigns, by their surrogates, but also by the mainstream media. And that, that too, came of age. A lot of it came from established internet uh, websites, but a great deal came from the ever-growing army of bloggers who, who were quick to get on uh, what they perceived to be inaccuracies or worse, uh, real distortions in either the coverage or in what was said. Um, the famous case, of course, was the unmasking of the um, faulty documents put on CBS purporting to describe uh, shortcomings in the President's National Guard service uh, back in the early 70s. Um, I am told that the first uh, questions were raised on a blog 18 minutes into the hour-long broadcast. Um, I don't know about you, but that raises some suspicions in my mind. Um, uh, as to whether or not uh, that blogger was put up to it or had information in advance about those documents, knew that the whole thing was coming down that night on CBS Wednesday, uh, 60 Minutes Wednesday. Uh, it just raises an interesting question. I'd be, I'd be uh, fascinated if anyone has any insights on that. Uh, it seems awfully quick to me. I, uh, I took this up with Walter Bender this afternoon. He, he um, uh, sought to persuade me that he, too, could have found the problem with a little TH in 18 minutes or less. Okay, well, maybe. So uh, I just I raised the question. Was it, in fact, spontaneous or was it not? I don't know the answer. Uh, in any event, I'm certain that the, the Internet will... And, and the bloggers especially, uh, will continue to play an even larger role. I think they, they have. Witness uh, the, the, just recently now the uh, unmasking of um, Jeff Gannon, a.k.a. Jim Guckert, at, uh, uh, in the White House uh, press room, a, uh, a writer for Republican-sponsored websites who... Um, uh, in fact, was his main function seemed to be to throw softball questions up to the president for him to hit out of the park uh, at, uh, in the news conferences and appearances in the press room. I, you know, I think that's that's interesting, more, more poignant in some ways, and certainly more consequential was the uh, uh, the early, um, uh, almost immediate. Uh, reaction of uh, the bloggers to Eason Jordan's remarks, the <clears throat> CNN president who spoke at Davos about, about the, uh, his, his uh, suspicions uh, about whether the coalition forces in Iraq had uh, targeted journalists. They, have, they killed 12. Was it accidental? Did he raise the notion that it was perhaps not entirely accidental that those journalists uh, got in the crosshairs of coalition forces? Um, an interesting question. Uh, he was uh, he, he backtracked from his statement to that regard um, while still on the panel when challenged to document what he was saying and to explain if it was true why it wasn't already on. CNN, uh, he backed off considerably, but 
uh, great attention was paid to it in the blogosphere, and and the heat built on Eason Jordan and forced his resignation, perhaps among other things, other causes, but forced his resignation uh, just in the last uh, last Friday. So, I mean, the impact, the immediacy, um, the probing quality was there in the in the campaign, and I think we see it continuing as a part of uh, media life now, and I expect that to can continue as well. Um, I thought there were some real lows in the coverage. Um, there was that whole senseless distraction about the war in Vietnam, not the war in Iraq, the war in Vietnam. We had to spend about a month arguing about that and the respective roles of the uh, two men to no end. Nothing new was turned up. Um, one of the unfortunate aspects when the controversy turns not from the subject but to the media delivering it, let's say Dan Rather in, in the case of the documents, is the original question tends to get lost. The original question was, did the president receive preferential treatment as the privileged son of a uh, distinguished uh, Texan uh, at the time he applied for a position in the National Guard and when he was allowed to exit it uh, before completing his service? That, and, and the corollary question, if those documents were fake, who faked them and why? Good questions. They get totally lost when the uh, controversy turns on the news organization delivering the news rather than the substance itself. Eason Jordan's question hasn't been addressed. What is the role, what was the role of uh, coalition forces in the death of 12 of 60-plus uh, journalists who have died in Iraq? Um, you know, it, it, there, I, I, in Vietnam, I, I recall commanders who felt uh, and would candidly say that anybody who got between them, their forces, their unit, and the enemy was, uh, uh, did so at his or her own risk and uh, was, if not a target, uh, not to be worried about. Uh, so attitudes differ. Uh, there are many unanswered questions about the killing of two journalists in the Palestine Hotel when a U.S. tank raised its barrel, fired uh, at a camera position located on an upper floor, and two journalists were killed. Uh, well, they said they took fire from the Palestine Hotel. Maybe they did. Uh, that was their defense. The Army looked into it. Lo and behold, the Army found itself guiltless. And um, I would argue that the matter has never been seriously examined or resolved. So uh, that's just sort of an unfortunate fact that when the controversy turns to the media, the substance gets, tends to get lost. Um, certainly the whole nonsense about the Swift Boat Veterans for Truth and their campaign, um, it was a fiction. And yet it was a fiction that was sustained by talk radio and talk television um, without, again, anybody examining what were the substance of the allegations made about Senator Kerry and his service. Did they hold water? Um, it, it, it went to the allegations, not to the, to the substance. That's, a, that's an unfortunate pattern. Uh, and it certainly qualified, in my opinion, for, for one of the real lows. Uh, in the campaign coverage. Finally, there, was a, there, there were some big shortcomings, it seemed to me, um, in the category sort of of unanswered questions and unaddressed topics. I don't think, for example, that news organizations have figured out how to cover the so-called war on terrorism as a political issue. It is, of course, a political issue. And it certainly was in the campaign. I don't think they've sorted that out and figured out how to address it and um, separate out what's, where the politics uh, and the news, if you like, 
intersect in that regard. Um, I think they tend to muddle the concept of homeland security and its concerns with this generic war on terrorism and then mix Iraq in in a, in a kind of mindless way and then they shorthand everything. And I, I'm, I'm certainly probably as guilty as, uh, as anyone else. But in the shorthanding, it all gets blended in uh, to a fair muddle, in my view. And I think that's a, I think that's a huge uh, uh, disservice. Now, it's argued that, uh, that the, um, the news organizations, that the media also missed the whole moral values issue. Well, I don't think that's true. I don't think they did miss it. They never labeled it that. I don't know what moral values mean in a political context anyway. But um, it's really about character and the perception of character. And I think they did address that in some respects. I think there were many articles, many, a lot of coverage on the question of the religious right and its role in this campaign and, and previous campaigns. This was not a mystery. We knew it was a growing force and an active force. Um, I recall reporting myself, and many others did, about the Bush administration, the Bush campaign's uh, vigorous pursuit of church groups and their, um, and their lists, their email lists and everything, building up a, uh, an almost unprecedented email community, if you like, of um, over six million people, many of which were drawn. They would just go and get entire lists from some very large congregations that might number in the thousands. And, um, and that's, that's interesting, I think, for the, A, for those congregations to address, and B, as, as a phenomenon <clears throat> in an electoral cycle, I, I find it quite interesting. But it was covered. So I don't, I don't quite agree that news organizations did not perceive the moral values question as being as important as it is. I'm also not persuaded by the polls that when somebody comes and asks you, what do you think uh, is most important, and they give you a list of four or five things, and moral values are one of them, which certainly, well, I'm very concerned about moral values. Put it right up there. If not at the top, right behind it. I mean, I, I just, I really question the whole thing. I wonder, wonder uh, how much there was to it. There were other whole subject areas that were not examined sufficiently that we're already uh, reading in the headlines now. Um, the president once or twice mentioned in the campaign, more than once or twice, he mentioned in the campaign uh, a concept to r reform or reorganize Social Security and to introduce um, uh, private accounts, uh, uh, sorry, personal accounts. Apparently, private is out. Uh, the White House has decreed private suggests privatization. Oh, no, no. We mustn't talk about personal accounts, so I'll try to be better on that. Uh, it, uh, it was part of his uh, platform, but I don't believe it was examined and, and probed in any, anywhere near the depth it is now receiving, which is very interesting. We can talk about that later, what's happening to that uh, that concept and that proposal and raise the question whether we will ever see a bill. Uh, I'm not persuaded that we will. But in any event, that's one. Um, endless talk about Iraq, but not really about foreign policy. It wasn't any foreign policy. It was Iraq policy. That's what we talked about. We didn't talk about the Middle East peace process, uh, which had by the time of the election, lain dormant and unattended for so long. We didn't talk about it. The issues were not raised. What about uh, dealing with China in the, in the new century? What about the big issues uh, in addition to Iraq? No, Iraq took all the oxygen out of the atmosphere, and very little else, in my experience, was addressed. So I think they all need uh, more scrutiny in the future. Uh, one last thing that was really missed and was so important, the, the Republican uh, competence at electioneering. I don't think anybody realized, or, and certainly few wrote, 
about how much better at getting their man elected the Republicans were. Uh, it wasn't just uh, Karl Rove. Uh, it was far more than that. It was a sophisticated operation in 50 states, more or less, and certainly in the important states, the, you know, the Ohio's, the Pennsylvania's, the Florida's, et cetera. Um, it was highly sophisticated, exceptionally well-financed, and much, much better than anything comparable on the Democratic side. That sh it should have been possible to determine that um, in the course of the campaign, not what, rather than to see it as evident as uh, anything could be when, the, when it was over. They had delivered, and they had become and have become much better at the business of American elections. And we can talk about why and, and what goes into that, but I mean, it's true, and that was a missed story. That wasn't, that wasn't uh, covered. Um, the other harsh fact about the coverage is that the truth is, despite the big turnout, a great portion of the public tuned out, on, except for a couple of moments, uh, the debates, which I think really have become the focus of our elections and are where the vast majority of people make up their mind, those, those who haven't already made up their mind. And to a lesser degree, the appearances at the conventions. Those are reduced to about an hour uh, or two of coverage, so you can't, can't place too much emphasis on that. I spent a week here in Boston. We, we covered it, uh, you know, four hours a night. Uh, uh, without regard to the health or interest level of our audience. And, uh, uh, and you know, I believe actually people do pay attention at that moment, uh, and they certainly do a, at the debates. But beyond that, uh, you know, again, despite the turnout, I, I'm not sure that the, uh, the vast complex known as the media uh, got through to uh, the public in any uh, great detail. Uh, maybe you can't penetrate it, but I'm, I'm not convinced that they did. Post-election, it seems to me that there has been a um, more critical, more skeptical view of the administration and its new initiatives, of the situation in Iraq and the realities that prevail there. Um, this remains to be seen, but I believe that if you look at the coverage surrounding uh, the inauguration, the State of the Union, some of the proposals that have come out of that and that the President is pushing, um, I think more questions are being asked, and that's a very good thing. The real test as we go forward from here is, uh, is how skeptical how probing, how questioning will news organizations and bloggers and everyone else be if, for example, the administration begins to beat the war drums again on Iran or, more likely, in my mind, Syria. Uh, you can hear a little of it now. How many questions are being asked? How, what, are the, what are the tough questions? What, are the, what is the goal? let's say, vis-a-vis -vis Syria. Is it uh, just to get their troops out of uh, Lebanon? We seem to have discovered that only a few days ago when Prime Minister Hariri was assassinated. You know, they've been there for 40 years. And, and, but now, we know, now it's an urgent matter. Let's get those troops out. I, I think a lot of questions have to be asked about what the real agenda is, about the approach to uh, the support for Hezbollah, about all these issues, and they're, they're complicated, they're separate from Iraq, they're different, and uh, intimately related to our support for Israel. And, and so those are questions that I, I would like to see asked, I would like to believe are being asked, and uh, hopefully we won't end up, as the generals always do, fighting the last war. Thanks very much.
Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the forum for inviting me. It's uh, a great pleasure and honor to be here at MIT. I hope everyone can hear me fine because I have a little bit of a cold and I just, uh, you know, if someone has trouble hearing me, just let me know and I'll try to speak up. Um, so the question of the, um, of the day is, did the media fail? And I guess one um, question that immediately arises is, did they fail to do what? Um, I suppose there are probably many people on the right who would say that the media had an agenda to defeat Bush and elect Kerry, and in that sense, they certainly failed if that was their goal. Um, and then on the other hand, you would probably find a lot of people on the left who would say that the duty of the media was to uh, uncover the truth about uh, uh, what the administration was up to and basically show the people that it was in their best interest to elect Kerry, and certainly they failed in that respect. So probably, at least as far as the mainstream media goes, I don't think anyone is too happy with it at the moment. Um, um, and you do find a lot of criticism on both the right and the left. Um, now, in my opinion, I, I do think I'm a little bit um, um, more pessimistic, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, than uh, Terence. I, I think that um, th th there was a failure to cover a lot of the issues in the election. Uh, I do think that it was an interesting campaign, but it was, uh, in a way, it was interesting primarily for being at least in my view, the most mean-spirited, the most hysterical campaign in my memory, or maybe it just seems that way after every election, I'm not sure. Um, uh, certainly, I think it's um, ridiculous that we spent um, a lot of time, uh, basically, as was said before, refighting the war in Vietnam. I'm not sure it was entirely the fault of the media, because in a way, the media kind of deal with what the, um, uh, the campaigns give the media. And um, I do think that, uh, in, in a way, the tone was set by John Kerry when he did emphasize his record in Vietnam um, at the convention and basically made that kind of one of his qualifications for uh, office, John Kerry uh, reporting for duty and um, all of that. Um, and, you know, predictably, uh, there was a response from people who uh, were, you know, whether or not they were formally affiliated with the Bush campaign, they were certainly on that side of the spectrum, who went uh, after Kerry on, uh, on that account. Uh, and I, I, I think, by the way, just, uh, I'm not sure that it really goes to the question of the media specifically, but I think uh, it was really not very smart to kind of underestimate, you know, knowing the full record of, um, you know, John Kerry's very vigorous criticism of the military after he came back from Vietnam. Um, I think it's kind of amazing that the Democratic Party underestimated the extent to which there would be a backlash among a lot of veterans. So I think, you know, the, the, the fact that the uh, uh, response to the swift boat um, ads was uh, so slow in coming, I, I think really shows a pretty shocking lack of foresight and preparation. Uh, I think it's something that they certainly should have been ready for. And again, I think that is really not so much the fault of the media as I think it is the fault of the campaign. Um, now, I think that um, th this election has been very interesting in the sense that, um, again, you know, agreeing, uh, agreeing with what was said before, um, uh, the, the, we do live in a new media world in a way. Um, it's been changing actually for a while. Um, it certainly was that the, the media landscape was changed by Fox News uh, in the sense that um, th there was this very kind of ideologically different voice. Uh, and certainly a lot of that was found in uh, not even so much the reporting as in uh, the talk shows on Fox. Um, and uh, then, of course, we also have uh, the rise of the blogs. Um, and, you know, it, it's just interesting how uh, the landscape is changing so fast. Uh, I mean, how many people three years ago even knew what a blog was? I mean, I remember, I'm not sure when, but I remember seeing this uh, article, um, I think it was in Slate, that was headlined, Do You Blog? And my thought was, do you what? I mean, it just, it, the, the word was just uh, something that I'd never heard before. It sounded kind of weird. It sounded, to me, at least like some kind of, you know, valley girl uh, jargon or, or something. Uh, I mean, it kind of sounded like a combination of bloat and blob, you know, which is not, 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 a, uh, not, not a commentary on the blogs at all. I actually have the utmost respect for the blogs, but, you know, it kind of took a while for me to get used 
of the word. Uh, and I mean, I, I will one of these days um, uh, get onto blogging myself. Haven't done that yet, but uh, I'm uh, certainly certainly getting there. I, I, I do occasionally post on the uh, blog of Reason Magazine called Hit and Run. Um, uh, now, uh, the blogs have changed um, uh, the, the media landscape, I think, uh, for better and worse. Uh, basically, the good news is that there are no more gatekeepers, and the bad news is that there are no more gatekeepers. Uh, and basically, we're looking at kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, I think, in a way, I mean, there has been a lot of very um, kind of wild-eyed, uh, incredibly optimistic talk about the rise of citizen journalism and uh, how basically anyone with a computer can now be a journalist. Well, you know, you do actually need to know something of, you know, what you write about. So it, it's very fine for, you know, every person to be their own journalist, but at the same time, it, it's going to create a lot more uh, kind of noise than uh, than light, uh, unless uh, we actually have people who um, bring some qualification to the to the job. And again, I did, I think that there are a lot of bloggers who um, definitely know what they're doing and who focus on their you know area of expertise. And um, I would also want to add that um, I think in a way some of the differences between the uh, blogs and the traditional media. Um, tend to get exaggerated. Like, uh, for instance, e even uh, what I just mentioned, uh, the, the issue of people writing on e in areas where they don't necessarily know a whole lot of, you know, don't necessarily have a lot of expertise. Um, a lot of um, people in my field, a lot of opinion columnists, <laughs> often do the same thing. Uh, and, you know, I try to avoid that. It's a, but it definitely is a problem in the field, because as an opinion columnist, you're expected to write about a very wide variety of things. And uh, a lot of the time, what people do is kind of rely on whatever experts they trust the most, and, you know, they basically select those on an, uh, tend to select those on an ideological basis. Um, so in that sense, I think the opinion columnists aren't really that different from the bloggers. Uh, now, in terms of gatekeeping, uh, it is quite true that the bloggers um, basically act as each other's fact checkers, so that, you know, y you can certainly argue that um, somebody who's spreading outright lies on blogs is going to be discredited pretty soon and um, is basically going to get caught. Um, now, the problem is, you know, the, the, there's this old um, adage that, uh, you know, a lie can get halfway around the world before the truth can get its boots on. And I think in a way that can pr probably happen even faster in the age of the Internet and the blogs. Um, and a lot of the time, um, I, I think one problem is that um, th there, there's just no way that people can really figure out which information to believe, because you have all this com competing information. And I think that was definitely the case with the, uh, uh, the f for a long time with the swift boat vets. Because, you know, I have to say, you know, I have seen some analysis on blogs on, you know, non-foaming at the mouth, you know, reasonable sounding uh, blogs that certainly made it sound like there was uh, a good deal of substance to these charges, uh, to, to some of them at least. Uh, and y y in the absence of being able to independently verify what people are talking about, again, you're left with a question of who do you believe, and you're left with a question of, you know, do you just end up believing the people that you're more ideologically in tune with? Um, and I think that kind of leads to, uh, I think both that and uh, the rise of the talk shows, I think leads to a greater polarization of opinion, uh, which I think is uh, really at a pretty unprecedented level right now. Uh, a lot of people, uh, at least in, in my uh, experience, uh, from people that I correspond with, uh, you know, people who send me feedback, a lot of people tend to, uh, when they go on the internet, to kind of stay in an ideologically congenial niche. You know, they go to the blogs where they will you know, where, where they are very unlikely to encounter anything that will offend their sensibilities politically. Um, they basically spend um, most of their time, I would say, uh, probably about 90% of their internet time reading stuff that reinforces their prejudices. Um, 
And I think that's certainly true for people on both the right and the left. Um, uh, I don't really see a whole lot of difference in that regard. Uh, so I think in that sense, uh, I, I think the blogs um, can be something of a problem, uh, although again, I, th I think it really only magnifies some of the tendencies that already exist in the, um, in the mainstream media. Um, the one interesting observation, by the way, that um, I heard the other day from Michael Barone, uh, who's a uh, political uh, commentator with the uh, U.S. News and the World Report and uh, appears in a number of um, TV programs. Uh, he was talking about the uh, role of the blogs in the election. And what he pointed out was that, it, it, at least in this election, uh, his opinion was that the blogs damaged the Democrats in two different ways. Uh, one of them was that the left-wing blogs tended to drag the Democratic Party over to the left. Uh, because that's where the, the democratic-oriented blogs were. And this ultimately, in uh, Barone's view, damaged the party's uh, prospects when it came to a national election. And at the same time, uh, the right-wing blogs um, did a pretty effective job of discrediting the mainstream media in certain cases, like, you know, so-called rather gay being. Uh, being the most obvious example, because I do think that the um, the, the, the whole incident with the fake uh, memos, you know, whatever the underlying facts of that were, certainly did end up creating the impression that the mainstream media were out to get Bush, uh, because you know it was uh, it was pretty shocking that CBS went with those memos when apparently there were. Uh, their own, some of their own experts were telling them that there's something very suspect about them, and it was just, uh, the, the, there was certainly a great deal of irresponsibility. Uh, now, I will not pronounce on whether that was political bias or just the rush to, um, uh, you know, get a hot story out. Um, I certainly do think that, you know, the, the media uh, were pretty tough on Clinton as well. Uh, so uh, I don't think that there's necessarily a kind of uh, <coughs> a tendency to go uh, easy on Democratic presidents. Um, uh, anyways, yeah, so I don't really know if uh, I completely agree with Barone's observation, but it, it seems to me that it's pretty, it, it's pretty solid. Uh, I think there's a lot uh, to that. And again, I don't know what's going to happen in the next uh, uh, few years with that. And uh, you know, w uh, right now, I think the majority of the blogs um, are still right of center. We're probably going to see more um, blogs uh, uh, kind of on the left side of the spectrum. Um, I don't know if we're going to see um, any kind of movement toward the center, uh, because again, right now I think the tendency is toward polarization, and um, and that, that is unfortunate. Um, now, I think the media, in a way, are going back to a, an older model of being more partisan, which I think is also the, uh, in, in many ways, is the European model of the press. Uh, in Europe, you will see uh, a pretty clear division where th there are some newspapers that are quite overtly uh, on the left or on the right, and uh, that and those newspapers are quite um, uh, explicitly in competition with each other politically and ideologically. And that was actually also the case in the United States. Um, I would say, you know, until. Uh, probably about 50 years ago. I mean, a lot of, you still see, see a lot of newspapers which have where the words Republican and Democrat and they're in their names. They don't really mean anything today politically, but those newspapers started out as, um, in some ways, um, kind of party publications that were uh, reflecting a party line. Uh, I, I think we're, in a way, we're going back to that. Um, and kind of away from this um, ideal of uh, kind of quasi-Olympian objectivity that um, um, that arose uh, in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, and again, that's kind of a mixed bag because on the one hand, I actually agree with a lot of the conservative critique that the, the, this alleged objectivity often served as a cover for uh, not even really conscious liberal bias, uh, quote unquote, but a kind of a set of unconscious assumptions uh, that often went unexamined and were um, often taken to be the truth. Uh, you know, for instance, that, um, um, and you know, I'm actually picking out a position that I myself agree with, you know, the, the position that being in support of abortion rights is, you know, the progressive and humanitarian view. 
Uh, I mean, I agree with that, and, but, but I do think that when that becomes a kind of unconscious assumption of the media, and when that re is reflected in the way that the, that the media cover the uh, pro-life and pro-choice movements, I, I think that that does become a problem. I mean, I think that it, if that is your view, you're kind of consciously confronted and then, um, and then kind of deal with it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think that, that those um, kind of unconscious assumptions uh, uh, did influence um, media coverage a lot. And I think we're probably going to see kind of more uh, overt politicization on the one hand and maybe less of this uh, kind of subtle and unconscious bias um, on the other hand. Um, on the other, you know, on the negative side, uh, I do think that it's, it is a good thing for the media to at least try to strive toward objectivity. And I think that if the ideal of, uh, of objective news coverage uh, goes completely by the wayside and it's kind of assumed by everyone that um, you kind of inject your political views into your coverage, um, I think that is going to be uh, very unfortunate for the media. Uh, now, I, I want to say a little bit about what I think uh, in, the, um, in the past election have been some of the uh, kind of labels and preconceptions that I think we have seen in the mainstream media. Um, I, I think a lot of the time what happens is that um, there is a certain script and, you know, then every, everything that, uh, that happens, uh, all of the news uh, uh, kind of gets tailored to that script and... and um, uh, then the, the, the perceptions of uh, various stories kind of um, uh, uh, basically uh, are squeezed into that. One uh, interesting example, I think, is the coverage of, uh, of the uh, religion and the, the church and state issues. Um, and during the campaign, we heard a lot about the right uh, and President Bush specifically mixing, uh, blurring the lines between church and state. And, you know, I, again, I have a lot of issues with that, but I think what's, what's interesting is that we saw a lot of talk, a lot of coverage about the role of religious groups in the Bush campaign and the, the recruiting in churches and, uh, uh, and so forth. And th there was some question raised about the tax-exempt status of uh, churches that were essentially being used as uh, political platforms. But what I found interesting is that at the same time, there was very little attention being paid um, to the role of, uh, you know, the long-standing role of African American churches in the Democratic Party, and I, I remember coming across a story in w a news story about a uh, rally, I believe, in Los Angeles, uh, that was held in an African American church, in which the minister said something along the lines of, you know, Kerry, which John Kerry has been chosen by God to, uh, you know, help us defeat Bush. And it just seemed really interesting to me that this kind of uh, rhetoric um, in the Democratic Party was getting so little attention. Um, and uh, again, the, the, the coverage of uh, these campaign stories was in a way kind of squeezed into these uh, stereotypes that you know Republicans are the ones who uh, mix church and state. Uh, the same thing I think um, happened with the red state, blue state labels. How much time do I have left, by the way? Um, sorry, I don't have a watch uh, with me. Um, yeah, the red state, blue state labels is actually something that started out in um, I right after the 2000 election, which I think, w was that the first time that they used the red state, blue state designation? Or um, Okay, because I remember reading that before that they used to kind of switch them, like sometimes the, the Democrats would actually be the, the uh, blue state and the, the Republicans would be the red state. Yeah, uh, and uh, I, I'm sorry, other way around. Uh, it started as a, as a right, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, I, I do think that they color-coded them before, but it wasn't a question of always using the same color for the same party. So I, I think after 2000, they just kind of ran with that. And then we got this, um, this you know, label of uh, blue state, red state. And what's, um, one thing that I find really infuriating about that is that people make these assumptions that, okay, you know, if Bush got a majority of votes in a particular state, you know, the whole state is labeled a red state. And, and I'm, basically there's this assumption that, you know, everyone in that state is a, you know, red state person. Well, you know, winning a state could mean that you got, 
you know, 50.1% of the vote. Uh, in a lot of the states, the, the election was really pretty close, uh, both, both in 2000 and um, in 2004. Um, so I think that the, the, this tendency of labeling, uh, you know, labeling entire regions uh, as uh, fitting a specific ideological pattern, I think is very simplistic. Um, the red state, blue state designation also, I think, seriously underestimates the um, uh, extent to which uh, people don't really fall into a kind of neat ideological package. A lot of people who... Um, voted for Bush, uh, I, I, I can't remember the exact figure, but I think something like close to 40% of Bush voters support abortion rights. Um, I, I think about a third of Bush voters uh, support gay marriage. Um, a lot of people, I mean, I have spoken to people who are you know, pro-gay marriage, um, bisexual atheists. Well, I mean, I, I've spoken to one person in that category who voted for Bush. And I mean, you know, that's, but I'm sure, you know, I'm sure that there are more. I mean, I've spoken to uh, people who, um, uh, well, I don't know. It would be interesting to do, a, uh, to do a kind of poll on that. I mean, I've certainly spoken to a number of atheists who voted for Bush. Um, um, so, you know, the, the, I think that this perception that, you know, if you're a Bush voter, you must be this, uh, um, you know, fundamentalist, uh, uh, you know, Bible-thumping, uh, anti-gay marriage uh, uh, person, uh, I think is in many cases is quite false. I mean, you know, 25% of gays voted for Bush. I, I think one, uh, one way in which the media, I think, did fail um, is uh, to cover the people, who give you know adequate coverage to people who don't fit the stereotypes, and I think the same thing, by the way, can be said uh, on the other side. I'm sure that there are many church-going, um, socially conservative people who voted for Kerry for uh, uh, all sorts of uh, reasons related to foreign policy, related to uh, economic issues. Uh, I think that there was, and still is, I think way, way too much of a tendency to just put people into these ideological boxes and not really look at people outside the box. <coughs> and I think that th that is one area where the media could do a much better job. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about the post-election climate. Okay. So uh, right now, the big story is uh, the, 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 the sort of media manipulation by the, by the White House. Uh, we've had, first we had the story with Armstrong Williams, who's the um, conservative columnist who was paid uh, $250,000 to promote, uh, I believe, Bush's No Child Left Behind policy. Uh, and now, of course, we have this new story with um, Jeff Gannon, uh, or uh, Jim uh, Guckert. Uh, who is this person who was apparently, uh, well, I think we're still learning the details of exactly how he got into the uh, White House um, uh, press room uh, using a false name, which, you know, obviously is uh, pretty bizarre, you know, in the age of heightened security that we live in. Um, now, I read a column today by Maureen Dowd um, basically saying that this is extremely scary and, you know, the Republicans are basically re uh, are not just tampering with the freedom of the press but kind of reinventing the press uh, by, you know, creating the, these, uh, you know, faux uh, journalists who are actually uh, kind of mouthpieces for, uh, for the Republicans. Uh, now, I have to say that Personally, this whole thing, you know, both the Armstrong and uh, Williams incident and the, uh, especially the Jeff Gannon incident, strike me as not so much insidious as just incredibly stupid. I mean, okay, Armstrong Williams, you pay, okay, it's not a huge amount of money by government standards, but I mean, you pay a substantial sum of money uh, for someone to promote your policies when they probably would have done it for free. Uh, you know, the guy is a pro-Bush columnist. I'm sure he would have... Uh, uh, written pretty much, you know, 80% of the same stuff if they hadn't paid him. Uh, I mean, th that is just bizarre. And then, of course, we have this uh, Jeff Gannon person. I mean, okay, what, what it sounds like is that the guy had a, may have had a deal with the White House where they would call on him to ask Bush softball questions. 
I mean, was it really worth it? I mean, if and couldn't they find someone who wasn't moonlighting as a uh, as a uh, stud uh, service person, you know, or whatever you want to call it? I mean, at the very least, if they wanted to use somebody for uh, for, for, for the person, uh, you know, for for the purpose of. Uh, uh, pitching softball questions to Bush, you know, they could have found somebody who wasn't going to, you know, get involved in a big sex scandal and who didn't have nude photos of themselves and, you know, sexual postures on the internet. Uh, so, I mean, it just, again, it strikes me as, um, I mean, the, the, this idea that the, the, the Republicans are these, you know, evil geniuses of media manipulation, uh, I don't really see any genius there. I mean, I see something <laughs> kind of on the other side of the spectrum, intelligence-wise. Um, so, you know, I, I think that this is going to be, um, that this is obviously going to be, it already is a huge embarrassment. I, I certainly think that um, the, the Jeff Gannon um, scandal is something that, you know, needs to be, uh, needs to be paid more attention to. Um, as far as just, you know, quickly wrapping up, again, I do want to remind uh, people that as far as, the kind of crossing of lines between, uh, you know, journalists and politicians. Uh, it has happened before in the respectable media as well. You know, we, I mean, some of some very respected journalists like Bill Moyers, you know, Chris Matthews, uh, um, you know, Sidney Blumenthal had previously worked as either speech writers or, uh, uh, you know, consultants or staff members for various politicians. I mean, uh, Henry Kurtzberg, um, the editor of the New Yorker and previously the New Republic. Uh, used to be a speechwriter for Jimmy Carter. So, I mean, I, I think, again, the crossing of lines between um, politics and the media is uh, really not something entirely new, and I think there is a bit of a double standard there when it comes to the right. Um, but anyway, I mean, certainly, uh, I think that, uh, that the uh, Republicans could have done a better job of it if they were going to cross those lines. So... Uh, Anyway, that's uh, you know just some random observations on the on the latest uh, event. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to thank both our speakers for staying within their time limits to allow what is always the highlight of a, a communication forum events, uh, passionate argumentative, but always civil and respectful interaction with our audience. Let me ask those of you who have questions or comments to come to the two microphones that are at either, uh, on either side of the aisle and pose your questions or comments. William okay. Uricchio. Yeah, hi. Um, a comment and a question. Comment for Kathy. I mean, just to follow up on your last uh, a uh, bit of discussion. I think Maureen Dowd's point was also that she was denied security clearance after having been in the White House circle since the 80s. So it wasn't right. just that someone yeah, that was let in with a double yeah. name and a sort of dodgy right. past, but that people that were legitimate reporters, in fact, were kicked out of the circle. And that's significant. Yeah, and I think that, the other no, thing. I agree with you. I agree with you on that. And actually. to underscore yeah. your left right yeah. difference and the bias yeah. being on the, on okay. the right no, in terms of critique, I, I just to continue. Um, I think the operate word you used to describe people like Bill Moyers, et cetera, was the, the past tense, were, were. They were in the employ of political organizations, mm, right. not at the same time they were reporters. And I think that's significant. Uh, the question is um, for Terrence and has to do with the question of agency. I was struck a couple of times by your description that um, stories seem to have a life of their own. Uh, there are ways in which the... Um, uh, you talked as though the paper was, that the, the press in a certain way was just following what was happening, that it wasn't in a certain sense setting the agenda that people would respond to. So that some issues emerge out in front and stay there longer than perhaps they ought to, that trivial issues are able to dominate the, the attention of the press for weeks on end while significant issues are kind of underplayed. I, I'm curious as to where, you know, as someone who's in the business of producing news, how does that happen? Is it a perception of what people what the audience wants? Or is it, as Kathy suggested, something that the politicians themselves dictate by keeping it in front and center of their agenda? Where's the agency here? Does the press not have a leadership role in terms of setting that agenda for the public? They do pick, um, uh, I believe news organizations do pick from among the uh, things that are <coughs> in front of them and already central in the campaign. So there's a, there is a somewhat of an agenda setting function. 
But in a case like that, just to take the swift boat veterans, for example, uh, it was a news story. I'm not arguing that it wasn't. It was uh, brought about by allegations in paid advertisements, incidentally very skillfully placed in only a few inexpensive markets, but picked up widely uh, and replayed repeatedly by uh, mass news organizations who did the work for them. Uh, you can cause a controversy for, you know, $700,000, which is a pretty modest buy in terms of political advertising. Um, and that's about what they spent. What, what, I was what I am concerned about is that too much time was spent regurgitating the allegations, what the motivations might be of those, um, how the Kerry campaign was dealing with it, were they too slow to respond, what was the price of that slowness, instead of stopping and trying to analyze the substance of the charges and do detailed reporting. Um, that was finally done. Uh, I think I can recall two excellent long uh, takeouts on that by the Washington Post and the New York Times, both of which found very little substance to the allegations and basically found that they did not hold water. But the, and they, they walked back the cap. They went through the allegations and what was the evidence and what were the purple heart citations and so forth. And they tried to construct uh, the record as best one can 30 years later based on the available evidence. But it took a long time. It, it took those two news organizations, despite their size and their staff, it took them weeks to get to the essence of the charges. And in the meantime, it was constant fodder on uh, all news cable networks and certainly on talk radio. And that's where I believe news organizations fell down. That you, you can't just keep repeating and regurgitating the same stuff over and over again simply because you don't have the time or the talent or the staff and the resources to go after the essence of the charge and establish to the best of your ability whether it's true or not. And that's the more important function, and too often uh, it gets neglected in favor of this other, which is just talk. Could I just make a quick comment to that? Okay, first of all, on the question of uh, were the media able to set the agenda, I think this is where you would have many people basically saying, well, why should the media set the agenda? You know, who elected the media? I think in a way, I think in a way it is the, the candidates who set the agenda. And, and in uh, the Swift Boat case, again, I, I do think that a major share of responsibility lies with, you know, the Kerry campaign for not being prepared to deal with those charges. A lot of those people were people that they had known about for months. You know, they didn't uh, really bother to do their legwork, and the other side did. So I think... Um, you know, obviously the media may have been slow to respond, but I think that, you know, if the Kerry campaign had those materials, you know, ready for them and had maybe done some investigative work of their own, you know, they could have, um, I think, um, kind of kept a lot of that in check. So I, I, I think, again, I, I don't think the media really bear all of the blame here. Uh, Over on this side. Yes. So uh, I'm may I ask you to identify yourselves, people? You, this mm -hmm. this event, of course, is being audio and video recorded, and if you identify yourselves, it will be helpful to the worldwide audience that will see this eventually. <laughs> yes, I'm Linda, and I'm support staff here at MIT, and um, I just I just wanted to say I agree with Ms. Young that um, the Kerry campaign should have foreseen the swift boat. Um, add controversy, but on the other hand, it was my also my experience that the media was very slow to um, uncover the details of the ad. In the beginning, um, a lot of the um, 
articles in the newspaper um, outlining the inconsistencies in the ad were buried maybe in the fourth or fifth page of the paper, or if you went to um, factcheck.org, mm -hmm. um, right. you could get that information, but you wonder how many people you know, would do that. So in general, I think um, I agree that the media was slow on the take up on that. Um, my second comment was on the um, red state, um, blue state, situation. I, my sister is an artist and I have been talking to her about this some. And um, red is a very dominant, vibrant color suggesting you know, power. And blue is more passive. And so I wonder whether the red state, blue state is sort of a media creation in itself. And if it hasn't been alternated in the past, perhaps you know it should be in the future. I do Thank believe that you. It was, <laughs> I, I do believe it was alternated in the past. But you know what's really funny is you know in terms of red being this really positive color. I mean, it's not that long ago that red was basically a synonym for communist, which is <laughs> which is really really ironic, you know, considering that now it's this uh, you know Republican color. Yeah, so. that's certainly what it means to my generation. Right. <laughs> It's very, and I, I have never thought about the, <laughs> the uh, you know, respective properties of red versus blue. I, I nor I really do I know uh, the origins. My impression is that it began as a graphic distinction on uh, television screens on election night coverage. I don't really remember if it was 2000 or 1996, or it doesn't really matter, and. It, but it became, um, you know, sort of set in stone uh, in 2000 yeah. when the election was so close and we looked at those maps and we came. And so, of course, you're right, Kathy, that, um, that many of these states are very close and, and that they uh, only become red states by virtue of a percentage or two. But, uh, you know, the, your complaint there has to be addressed to the Electoral College not to the uh, depictions of it. That's our way our system works. So well, does, no, 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 no. I don't have a problem necessarily with, you know, the fact that the state, that the entire state basically, you know, is counted as going unanimously for Bush. But I'm saying that in terms of media analysis, I think, you know, we in the media should know better than to kind of lump everyone who lives in a, you know, red state or blue state together as uh, being this monolithic mass. And I think that is something that often has happened. And uh, um, it I, has, I think it, again, there's a lot of stereotyping uh, on both sides. And, and again, I do think that the media partly perpetuate that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't disagree at all. It's, it's more of the shorthanding I was yeah. talking about. Right. You, it's a shorthand <laughs> reference for a state carried by President Bush in the uh, recent election. And that's all it really is. As to the power or passivity of the colors, I, I'll defer to you. Let me, may I encourage uh, the, both speakers at the, at the uh, microphones and the speakers at our table to be succinct. We have a lot of people who want to make comments and have questions. And the, more, uh, the briefer we are and the more pointed we are, the more exciting the discussion. Yes. Well, here's a brief one. Um, Identify I'm, yourself. I'm Joellen Easton, a graduate student in comparative media studies, and I suppose this question is mostly for Terence. Could you contextualize um, the resignation of the PBS president, Pat Mitchell, in the context of what we're talking about today? <coughs> yeah, let me, let me uh, correct uh, the verb there. She, she's not resigning. Um, <laughs> she's uh, filling out her term, which has another 15 months to go. Um, and uh, merely advise the station managers at a meeting on Tuesday of this week that, that it, uh, she had said this before, that she was gonna, this is her second term, she'd completed in that, and she would not uh, want to continue after that. But there's a bigger issue here um, that was raised on the front page of both the New York Times and the Washington Post today, which is, um, the changing world in which the public broadcasting system is operating today. <coughs> changing in terms of corporate underwriters who are less willing to support 
uh, public broadcasting for a variety of reasons, uh, a changed atmosphere in which um, the political um, perspective of different broadcasts is being examined much more critically. And finally, a, 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 a sort of a, a struggle for, for its soul for PBS. What is the role of public broadcasting in a 200-channel universe where its cultural and educational uh, roles, which were very important at the beginning, have been at least complemented, if not supplemented, by uh, many channels from discovery to arts and entertainment to uh, you name them. You know, there, there are now a lot of channel, history channel, et cetera. So um, I think the public broadcasting system has a great deal to offer, is very important, should be preserved, should re receive, in my opinion, uh, some uh, financial independence, um, a trust fund, in effect, uh, that would separate it from political considerations. Uh, but I think it does need to define itself for itself better if it's to go forward and, and be effective, and I certainly hope it does. Hi, my name is John, and I'm a retiree, MIT retiree. I have a basically a bad opinion about media, but I'll just choose one. Uh, during the presidential uh, campaign, there was a uh, constant coverage of two candidates, and they, basically each candidate was very close to each other's uh, ideas. And they repeated those five ideas over and over and over, and I stopped watching it a long time before the elections. And why they didn't cover the uh, third party and fourth and fifth uh, party candidates if they were kooks, uh, people could decide for themselves that they are kooks, but at least some new ideas would come surface. And uh, is there a script? Is there a group think about media? Or what is it that they are avoiding uh, other candidates like a third rail uh, electric guard? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I have a, uh, sure. I'll be brief and you pick it up, Kathy. I, um, News organizations have an additional obligation, though. They, have, they know there's a limited amount of time and attention the public is willing to pay. <clears throat> and so they have to focus it where they believe it matters most. And, um, I, and there was some coverage of Ralph Nader and, other, and uh, the other candidates, but not much. I, your, your, your point is, is very well taken. Um, you, you just, it's a balancing act. How much are you going to give to candidates that can introduce new ideas into the debate, if they do, and can um, uh, add to the total that way, but who are not going to win? And you can't divorce yourself from the political reality of what's going to happen. And therefore, I think you have to cover them, but you, but you also have to know that you have limited time and attention and husband it carefully. Yeah, I think once again, uh, the, the issue is not so much with the media as I think with the political structure in the United States. We do have basically a two-party system. The, the, the political system is really built in such a way that it's very, very difficult for a, the, well, I would say, you know, pretty much impossible for a third-party candidate to be elected. I mean, you know, Ross Perot was the one who, <laughs> came closest to actually, you know, getting a respectable number of votes, but even he didn't come any, anywhere close to winning. Um, I think there's, um, so yeah, I, I certainly agree with, with what Terrence said about there being limited time. Um, you know, third party candidates are generally not included in the debates, um, although I suppose that is partly the media's responsibility since the, the media organize the debates. But there you really do get into the question of, you know, if you open up the debate to third party candidates, how many people are you going to have up there on the podium? And, uh, you know, is there some kind of minimal... Uh, uh, I, mean, I, I think it, it really does get into the question of uh, time and uh, you know, immediate resources. Uh, Actually, basically. you know, the Commission on Presidential Debates is the one that sets the, um, the uh, threshold right. okay. of mm -hmm. uh, you have to have 
certain percentage in the public right. opinion yeah. polls to be included is not the meeting. It's the commission. Right, okay. So yeah, the, the, that just kind of further proves my point. I, I think the media really, again, in a way, kind of follow the agenda that is set by the, um, by the politicians. Amy McCreeth, Technology and Culture Forum. So uh, some of my earliest memories when I was growing up are of the Watergate hearings. And I, I'm part of a generation that's very cynical about government. It takes a lot to get us to trust uh, when it comes to political life in the country. And the students that I work with here at MIT seem to have the same degree of cynicism about the media. Uh, a lot of the students that I talked with this fall and the students that I work with still simply don't get news from the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. um, they watch Jon Stewart, <laughs> they uh, go to the BBC, or they go to alternative media sites, um, some of them religious, some of them secular, but you know, not any of the sort of corporately owned media sites, um, nor do they go to PBS very often or NPR. Um, and so this concerns me quite a bit in terms of the future of democracy and people's um, knowledge about what's happening in politics and making good decisions as voters. Um, a lot of the students that I talked to just sort of tuned out pretty uh, early in the election process because they felt like they were sort of being manipulated, being sold on things when they turned to, um, to mainstream media. So I'm just wondering if you could comment on that and what you would say to those students uh, to sort of get them to re-engage and what the media might do to, uh, to restore the faith of younger citizens um, and, and to get them back as readers and as listeners. That's a really good question. Um, I think, um, you know, one way to, um, I think, re-engage um, the younger generation is probably for the media, for, for the mainstream media to kind of get into um, some of the areas where the new media have been um, kind of rising. Like, you know, I, I think that we should see uh, probably, you know, more blogging by mainstream media people. Um, I think one of the, one of the issues uh, in addition to just this perception of uh, you know manipulation and kind of general alienation, I think one issue is kind of speed of news. I think the younger generation generally is used to kind of everything happening at really high speed, and I think uh, you know that 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 is part of um, I think the appeal of blogging, this kind of instant uh, instant news. Um, other than that, I. Uh, I mean, I think greater diversity of voices in the media certainly would be uh, w w would help, and I'm talking about you know not just diversity of you know gender, ethnicity, et cetera, but uh, diversity of viewpoints. Um, I think that would certainly help because um, I think part of the problem is this perception that you're getting this kind of monolithic mainstream, um, you know, kind of liberal centrist, fairly bland, uh, you know, set of opinions. And, um, and, you know, this is maybe where I was talking before about this kind of tension between partisanship and objectivity. I mean, I, I think younger people probably, you know, more so than, the, than, you know, previous generations are very skeptical of this kind of, you know, attitude of this Olympian objectivity where the journalist is just this, you know, supposedly completely neutral observer just, you know, reporting the facts and not injecting their opinion. I think a lot of uh, the younger generation kind of has trouble believing that, you know, people can really keep their opinions out of, uh, out of journalism, so maybe the the answer is not so much to have this, um, you know, to try to reclaim this uh, kind of Olympian stance as to have more competing viewpoints and, uh, you know, kind of hope that uh, in the competition of these viewpoints, the truth will eventually emerge. I would just add, I agree with that, I would add one other word, interactivity, that somehow Mainstream media has got to be able to talk back and forth with its uh, audience and, and get an exchange going that is, uh, has not been true in the past, is maybe not sufficiently true now, 
and is crucial to going forward and getting a kind of, building a kind of confidence. For the longest time, it was believed that younger people, you know, traditionally don't read newspapers, don't partake of mainstream news until the notion was they get a little bit older into their late 20s or whenever, they get married, have a child, a mortgage, and uh, worry uh, uh, some more about some of the issues that, that uh, are in the paper and, and then begin and become customers and, and you know, build the base. I'm not certain that's, uh, that model is going to continue. And therefore, I think they have to, uh, that's why I say interactivity, they have to begin to communicate more effectively with the audience and find a way to establish what they're really, what people in the audience are concerned about and and address those things and, and write about those things. Hi, uh, my name is Oliver. I'm support staff here at MIT. Um, I found it interesting that the subject of today's talk was uh, 2004 uh, election, and you, you guys both spoke very eloquently about the campaign and what happened after the election, but nothing was really spoken, as far as I can remember, about what actually happens on November 2nd. And I remember feeling very distinctly in 2000 um, <coughs> that, my God, you know, we don't necessarily have one person, one vote in this country as long as not every vote counts. And that was like a huge realization to me, and I don't think I was alone in that sort of awakening feeling. And I was paying attention very intently this time around to find out what the coverage would be like of what happens on November 2nd. And I didn't feel that the coverage was really adequate. I still have a lot of questions about the Diebold machines and about the fact that in many minority communities, you had people waiting online for six, seven, eight, nine hours. It seems to me as long as you have that, you don't have legitimate government. And I didn't really feel like there was enough coverage of that in the media. There was some. Um, the election night um, uh, was interesting in that uh, the largest news organizations did not repeat the fiasco of four years earlier and miscalled the election. In fact, they held their fire in the face of exit polls that uh, were quite faulty, based on a faulty sample, and were suggesting through the afternoon that John Kerry was going to win. And they had that information as uh, the evening newscast went on the air and, and started <coughs> to uh, bring in returns after 7 and 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern, and yet they held back. They did not make any faulty projections. As to the coverage of irregularities, there was some, but I believe there was a basic conclusion reached, and I don't know if you disagree with it, um, that the uh, irregularities, to use that word, or abuses were, were not enough to change the outcome. That seemed to be the consensus position that was arrived at, that despite all the problems that you just cited, of long lines and uh, mechanical breakdowns and other things, that in this case, there was enough of a margin that it wouldn't have made the difference. Yeah, there was actually a very um, well-researched, uh, I thought, piece on Salon.com, which is hardly a pro-Bush publication, uh, to put it mildly, which looked at a lot of those charges and basically said, you know, look, we really wish it were true, but it doesn't, you know, it's just not enough to change the outcome. And again, I, I want to return to, uh, you know, what seems to be my kind of mantra this, <laughs> this evening, which is, you know, the agenda in many ways is set by the politicians. I mean, if the Kerry campaign had chosen to challenge the election results, that would have been a huge story. But I mean, the Kerry campaign decided that there wasn't enough there to uh, bring a challenge to the, to the, uh, to the election results, and uh, hence it did not end up being a huge story. Hi, my name is uh, Christian Vaccari. I'm a visiting graduate student from the University of Milan. Um, Mrs. Young has brought it up a couple of times, so I wanted to address the issue of the uh, increasing partisanship in the media. And, uh, you know, this is not the golden age for American parties. There's a lot of independents out there. They're supposed to be the fastest growing kind of political population. And yet, the media are becoming much more partisan now than they used to be in the 50s and 60s, where a lot of more Americans identified with the parties. Uh, the same with young generations. They are largely, you know, apolitical or, you know, they don't know yet. A lot of them just don't pay much attention or they have not developed a political attitude yet, which is so firm. And yet, 
they don't seem to believe that there is objectivity and they'd rather go to some more partisan and you know, ideological media. Uh, why is that? Is that a failure in the you know, traditional institutional media? Is it a, a, a way to garner some new marketplaces for media that are, see their audiences shrinking? Uh, what it is from the perspective of you know, journalists? Hmm, I, I th uh, could I take that first? Or sure, you, okay. um, Yeah, I, I think part of the uh, reason maybe that there was growing partisanship is that I think the, um, the people who are less partisan tend to be kind of more laid back, apathetic, you know, less involved. Because you do have the, the, these populations on both the kind of fairly extreme left and, well, not, I don't want to use words like extreme because that, that has all these negative connotations, but, you know, basically further to the end, you know, further away from the center to both the left and the right, um, people with, you know, really strong opinions. Um, and I think because those people feel more strongly about, you know, things, I, I think they're much more likely to seek out, um, um, you know, media outlets that, essentially you know support their views media outlets where they would feel at home politically so I think that's uh, the, the, that really accounts you know partly for the polarization uh, that's you but, know. but I think you're mixing two things there, there mm -hmm. is there's on the one hand there is a greater polarization in the public that's clear uh, a almost cultural <laughs> clash in this country um, on the other and and on the other hand there is uh, obvious disaffection among younger people with mainstream media. I, I agree with you on that, Amy. The, uh, but they're not the same thing. The polarization, this is a divided country, it's divided on, on the issue, some of the issues we've been discussing, and it's come down, split almost in the middle in two elections now. Uh, you can't get them any closer than this. So it, it, it's a, it is divided in, in at least the choices it makes for president and, and uh, high office. Um, but this other tendency that Kathy referred to, which is, which is interesting, which is you, you go to the news that supports your views, uh, is, is a phenomenon that uh, has um, certainly increased in the last 10 to 15 years and is requires some real study. I agree that people, for a variety of reasons, go to those outlets that reflect where they stand. I think they're doing so not for information, but for reaffirmation mm -hmm. of the wisdom of their view. Yep. And uh, sometimes for entertainment. It's a form of entertainment, not... <laughs> And question how wonderful mm -hmm. it is, but I mean, right. you know, to hear people uh, echoing your views on on controversial issues. Well, uh, I think it's also maybe feeling a feeling kind of a part of a community, especially in some of the yeah. you know blogs that have these you know open comments where people basically talk to each other. And again, I, I do think that part of the problem is that it becomes a kind of echo chamber where you only talk to like-minded people and. Uh, then you kind of come in for a rude surprise when you emerge out into the real world. <laughs> so, uh, or, or come out on the short end of an election. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. right. Which Please. side do we go to now? Is it? Yeah, okay. <coughs> I'm Blossom Hogue. I work here at MIT, and I also am very active with the Sierra Club. Um, I certainly agree that uh, Kerry's campaign was um, not the most organized that it should have been, and... Um, probably, I question that he was the right candidate even um, for the Democratic Party. Uh, unfortunately, the vi environmentalists, I think, also uh, should have that charge that uh, they, as much time and effort that they put in to getting out there and, and working on campaigns, um, it, it didn't make the difference. And probably the religious right was able to uh, bring out more of the young people and counteract um, the environmentalists. But the, the question is, I mean, environmental issues, I haven't heard you, ne either one of you speak of them. Um, it was certainly not brought out in the campaign. Here we are again, we've not signed the Kyoto uh, Protocol. Uh, this is a travesty. 
And yes, the uh, campaign and uh, issues are dictated by the commission and by the campaigns, but I think the media can delve and uh, massage and, and go into other areas than, than just what is being dictated to uh, be brought to the forefront. And I'd like to have your comments on that. I, I'm uh, actually curious what you think, whether, whether you believe, what would it have taken to arouse the environmental community more than it was in this last election. You had a, uh, an administration that had rolled back uh, virtually every significant piece of environmental legislation and promised to do more. And yet it did not, you're right, it did not become front and central in the campaign and the voice of those who were alarmed by that, those voices were not as uh, loud or passionate or paid attention to as one might expect. I'm, I'm not, you know, you say maybe Kerry wasn't the best candidate. Well, who was better? Uh, that's always the question you have to ask yourself in that regard. But what Al Gore. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, I mean, that's, that's an, you know, that's a plausible man came either, either one in 2000 or came very close to it depending on how you define it. And in any event, won the popular vote. So, um, you know, you, you can do, but where was? I think the environmentalists get treated as kind of a third party um, in the same, in that uh, way that they, they aren't really brought to the forefront by the media <coughs> and, and uh, the, the dialogue isn't there. And that's one of the big problems. But they have money, they have organization, they have the capacity to participate in the process. And we put a lot of people out there in, in most of the states, but I agree, it wasn't enough. <laughs> but Blossom, your point really is uh, 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 that the me your question really is, why did the media not cover more of the environmental, environmental argument, issues. despite what, whether or not the candidates were addressing the question? Correct. I mean, the, the environmentalists supported Kerry because of his environmental background and stance, and yet that never came out anywhere, and it never got to be an issue somehow, and I'm not sure how we go about changing that. I, I think, you know, part of the problem, I think, is that, you know, in in this election, though, as uh, Terence has said, you know, the, the Iraq kind of ended up sucking the hair out of everything else, so to speak. A lot of other issues um, ended up being treated as secondary because, uh, you know, the, the, in a w in many ways, this did end up being an election about the war, and the, the, there were. I mean, the, the, the I, I guess the, the public does generally have a limited um, amount of you know, issues that it can pay attention to at the same time. And um, the, the, in this election, the environment kind of ended up not being one of the issues on the front burner. And again, I, I, I think part of that is uh, is, is the candidate's uh, fault in that I, I don't remember Kerry making the environment all that big an issue in his right. campaign. So Actually, I, I don't think it was Iraq. I think it was a 9-11 election well, right, and the yeah. aftermath and how this right. country was yeah. dealing with that. And since Iraq has very little to do with 9-11, uh, it um, uh, was almost a separate subject. Well, but it did, but it it did was, push, yeah. I agree that it did yeah. push terribly important issues like the environment and others down in the public um, attention meter or whatever you want to call it. Right, I would actually say that it was it was the Iraq election on the, you know, among Democrats and the 9-11 election for Republicans because I think for, you know, the, the, that I think was the real divide because I think for the uh, for the Democrats it really was mostly in a referendum on the on the war in Iraq and I think for for a lot of Republicans, I think, or well, not, not just Republicans, but you know, Bush voters who obviously include a lot of independents. Uh, and you know, by the way, I do, I, I think that the, the, the argument that it was really about you know moral values, uh, as a you know, gay marriage and so forth, uh, the, as opposed to uh, the national security and terrorism and the war in Iraq, uh, that eventually didn't hold up. I think that that was kind of the initial 
impression that was created by some of the poll analysis. But I think that when, when you add up some of the different questions like, you know, national security plus, plus the war in Iraq, you know, plus some other related issues, I, I think you do end up with, uh, uh, you know, a very different picture. And I, I, I do think that for most of the electorate, it was uh, primarily about those issues. You mean the Massachusetts State Legislature didn't lose it for John Kerry? <laughs> I, I got it wrong. Oh, well. <laughs> you know, uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I, I want to take the moderator's uh, uh, prerogative to mention that we have about uh, 15, 16 minutes left, so there's time for questions, but also to make a, uh, a brief observation. Uh, this is not a conclusion that I draw only from our discourse this afternoon, although it has been reinforced by this, but I'm, I, I, I fear that... Uh, the tendency on maybe both the right and the left, but certainly among among Democrats and the, among those that 50, nearly 50 percent of the country who feel that this election was a catastrophic error, uh, that the impulse to blame the media for what happened is a very strong one. But it may well be that the one conclusion to draw from what's, what we've already heard is that the problem is with the democratic process. It isn't <laughs> the media that's failing, but the democratic process as it's a, a structured in the United States that's failing, that there are not, uh, the, uh, there isn't a kind of European model in which there are a range of different parties that you can vote for. There isn't a parliamentary model that would allow for uh, different sorts of voices to come out. And the, so the sort of simplifications that Kathy was describing are inherent in a two-party system. And mm -hmm. uh, many of the difficulties that are being described here are not functions, I, it seems to me, of media coverage so much as, uh, they, as they are a function of the way the process itself operates. Um, could I quickly comment on that, uh, just course. in terms of the oversimplification? I, I think one um, really underestimated phenomenon is the number of people who really do feel kind of politically homeless at the moment because they feel very alienated by, you know, some aspects of both parties' uh, platforms. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of um, fiscally conservative, um, you know, people who are, you know, somewhat hawkish on foreign policy who at the same time are just, you know, appalled by the rise of the religious right and the, 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 the stance on abortion and uh, gay rights and uh, stem cell research, et cetera. Um, and, you know, at the same time, there, there are also a lot of um, um, socially conservative Democrats who um, support the economic program of the Democratic Party and the foreign policy uh, program, but at the same time feel very alienated on those social issues. So I think there's, uh, there are a lot of people who, uh, you know, usually do end up voting one way or the other, you know, or maybe not. Uh, but who really are kind of being missed by this um, by this polarizing discourse where everybody is kind of packaged into these neat little boxes labeled red or blue. Right. So uh, we're here. I'm Alexandra. I'm on staff here at the Media Lab, and I, I, a lot <coughs> of the topics that you've been covering sort of come into the same ball. You know, when you talk about alienation. I think that the candidates just kept adjusting the same points over and over and over again, and they were so close together that it was hard to sort of differentiate. And yet each could have um, made that differentiation with uh, things that they had expertise in. The environment is a huge example. Both um, Kerry and Al Gore had a lot of interest and a lot of experience and were very eloquent on issues of the environment and yet didn't bring it up. And I would question 9-11 as as determining that because I don't think Al Gore brought it up very much um, during his campaign when he could have made it a big, uh, a big, big differentiating point. Um, and uh, Kerry cer certainly could have too. So I, I, I wonder, are they so concerned about how they're going to be perceived or how their, their messages are going to be picked up by, their, by the media or the public that they refrain from adjusting it at all? It's a matter of proportion. I mean, they, they do bring it up. They do make speeches about the environment and, and challenging their opponent's position and so forth, and they're covered, and, and, and the debate moves on. Uh, it's, so it's a matter of, but what catches your attention? Your memory, and I understand that, is that it was barely brought up. Uh, well, because it was, it was drowned out, basically, by the other uh, bigger issues or themes. I, I shouldn't even say bigger just other issues and themes in the, in the campaign. Candidates repeat again and again what they believe are the four or five or six basic 
points that they're trying to get across to the public. Rightly or wrongly, they believe in repetition and believe that that's the way you get it across. And so that, I think, accounts uh, for the repetitious nature of, of much of what they do and say in advertising, in speeches, in uh, points made in the debates. And that, that's a, uh, uh, you know, that's why it all sounds the same. Yeah, I think also the, the other um, factor not to be you know, underestimated is that um, you know, beyond a certain point, the environmental message you know, can be alienating to a part of the electorate. And then not obviously not the basic message of environmental protection, but if you look at, for instance, some of the things that Al Gore said in uh, the Earth and the Balance book, um, he was basically arguing that we need to radically restructure our lives and our society and kind of dramatically scale down and you know, alter consumption uh, for the sake of the environment. And that is a message that is going to be pretty controversial. So I, and I think it's, um, it's something that can be very easily used by you know, the other side to say that you know, the Democrats want to sacrifice your job to save the spotted owl. And, um, you know, that, that, that I think is part of the, um, uh, part of the reason that it's not, um, maybe, that it's not brought up as much as uh, you would like to because it's not quite as automatically a winner as, uh, as it may at first glance appear to be. So. Hi, I'm Ann Weber. I'm down from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and I'm a writer, and I'm actually writing an article this weekend for a newspaper on the new media. And I'd like to ask a question that is based on several of both of your comments. Mrs. Young, you had mentioned that one of the things that could help the media is to offer a greater diversity of voices. And Mr. Smith, you had mentioned that, for example, in the case of the Swift Boat uh, controversy, one of the reasons the media couldn't do a quick and effective review of these uh, claims was because of resources. Given that, would, would you like to comment on the impact of media conglomeration on the coverage of the campaign and on the continuing coverage of the admi administration? Well, it's the single most striking trend in, uh, in the media, I mean in that world, uh, of the last 15 years. Uh, the largest voices are now held among the fewest uh, number of um, owners and uh, the consolidation <laughs> continues it's part of um, the economic pressures on the industry um, it's uh, also uh, the point has been made that uh, say television news is a victim of its own success in that it has 60 minutes and other broadcasts prove that it can be extremely profitable and uh, as they began to bring in uh, money, and as the networks were acquired by much larger conglomerates, um, the news division became simply another profit center, another cog in the larger wheel, and was told to produce the uh, revenues and, um, and do so on uh, smaller and smaller budgets. Um, the budgets themselves actually increase because of the increasing cost, but percentage on a percentage basis, they go down. Um, I think where you see it a, as a problem in, in political coverage, just staying with the election, is not, when, not um, uh, in what you might call the established opinion press. Uh, for the from generations, we know that the Nation is a liberal magazine. We know that National Review is a, a largely conservative magazine. There's no confusion among the audience. There's no concern there. The problem arises when opinion uh, is inserted under the guise of objectivity. When you say to your viewers over and over again that you are fair and balanced, when you are neither. That's the problem. That's where the deception arises, not the clearly labeled opinion press. Uh, yeah, well, in terms of conglomeration uh, specifically, um, I'm actually not sure that uh, 
you know, ownership, you know, that, that kind of, you know, fewer or owners necessarily means more uniformity of views because you could have, you know, more spread out ownership with, you know, basically most of the editors, most of the producers, most of the journalists coming from the same kind of cultural and uh, political background. And I think you would, you know, that would give you a certain amount of uniformity regardless of who the owners are. Um, I think that um, you, one one problem that I actually do see, and it's it's not really so much conglomeration as uh, uh, in a lot of cities. For instance, if you look at the print media, uh, a lot of you know two, three, four newspaper cities. What used to be, you know, in the past, two, three, four newspaper cities are now basically one newspaper cities, two at the most. Um, so I, I think the closing of newspapers, uh, which had uh, you know d diverse uh, editorial positions, um, I think is a problem. I mean, ownership um, again. Uh, well, for instance, I, I before I uh, wrote for the Boston Globe, I used to um, write for the Detroit News. Um, at one point at the Detroit News, uh, this was in the early uh, no, actually the late nineties. The Detroit News basically merged its business operations with the Detroit Free Press. I mean, they, they basically they had the, they had the same uh, the same ownership. They're in the same building. Yeah, they're in the same building. Nevertheless, you know, the Detroit News is recognizably you know with a more conservative slant, and the Detroit Free Press is uh, fairly liberal. So you know, I, I think that owners generally recognize that you know if it's in their interest. Uh, in terms of you know profit to provide um, a platform for diverse views, you know they will generally do that. Uh, so I, I don't know that conglomeration per se is a problem, but I, I do think that in this regard, uh, the, the rise of the blogs and you know the rise of the internet-based media really is quite refreshing because the, the startup costs are really very low, and. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, it, it certainly does bring a lot of uh, different voices into the fold who would not have been heard uh, before. And, uh, and I think that is one of the positive developments, definitely. Over here. Yes, hi, my name is Reka Murthy. I'm a student with CMS, Comparative Media Studies. Um, I had a question, but I actually decided to drop it because of a recurring theme that I've heard in what Kathy was saying that I find pretty intriguing. Um, you said at one point early on, who elected the media, As, and then you've kind of continued to say throughout the course of the evening that the media doesn't set the agenda the politicians do. Um, for any number of reasons, I find that actually quite troubling, and I would love to hear a clarification, because in, from my point of view, um, being elected, it, that kind of a statement assumes that the media has to know its place as an inferior place beneath politicians who've been publicly elected. It also assumes that being elected is a complete expression of the voice of the people. It also kind of implies that the media is a monolithic party in and of itself, and we all know that that is not the case. So I just want to, would love to hear, I, I want to know if more of your colleagues, if you feel that other people share this same view of the media's role in politics. And, and to hear maybe if, if you have a clarification on your statement. Uh, sure. Well, I, I think that when, when the question is asked, why didn't the media set the agenda, I think that does in a way presume that the media are you know, a fairly monolithic body that would have the same idea basically of what you know, the agenda is. Uh, now, in terms of um, the, should the media know their place, well, I, I certainly <laughs> think that you know, the media a part of the media's role is to um, be, you know, to be watchdogs. And of course, you know, now we have uh, we have the blogs functioning as watchdogs watching the media. So, you know, uh, the, it's just kind of getting more and more complicated with all these different layers of uh, of monitoring and fact checking. But yeah, I, I think certainly the media um, have um, have a very important role as as watchdogs in terms of setting the agenda, uh, I mean, I don't know that, I mean, who sets the agenda is a really, really complicated question. I, I think ultimately, um, you know, the, I, in an ideal world, of course, the people would set the agenda in terms of, uh, you know, what their concerns are, but of course those concerns are, you know, largely dictated 
or at least shaped by um, what ends up being reported in the media. Um, so I, I, I think there is, the, the, there's a very, very complicated and kind of, uh, you know, often sometimes symbiotic, sometimes adversarial relationship between the media, the, the public, and the politicians. Uh, just one, uh, one really quick comment. I do think that in, um, you know, in, in recent decades until maybe, until maybe the past few years, I do think that there was something of this media monolith which really did believe that, and you know, to some extent still does, that part of its role is to, um, you know, not just report the news, not just examine the news, but actually set the agenda, um, and you know, promote certain you know political values. And I and I think to some extent, if you really think about it, that really does clash with objectivity, though, uh, because then. I mean, if, if you're promoting a certain agenda, uh, I mean, it, it just seems to me that th that's not entirely compatible with being objective. So, you know, I, I don't know if that if that answers your question. You know, when you ask the other part of your question, who who elected the media? Of course, no one elects the media. He, the only people who elect <laughs> this newspaper or that broadcaster or whatever are the people who pay a dollar to buy the New York Times right. or turn on the television to this mm, yeah. channel versus that. They elect who uh, or which organization to watch, to believe, mm -hmm. and to return to. That's who elects the media. Steve. Hi, I'm Steve Brophy. I'm a teaching assistant in the literature department. Uh, I've got two questions that I think are interrelated. One is, uh, it's an addressed to Mr. Smith because it's another um, uncovered election story. Why was it apparently taken for granted that it was okay for the representative of the Republican Party who was running to be president of all the people to only address audiences that were made up of invited people and mm -hmm. that, you know, anybody who didn't, wasn't ready to sign a loyalty oath to the Republican Party was ejected. The second question is um, we had polls throughout the period that said that showed up to approximately 40% of uh, the people polled believe that weapons of mass destruction had been found in Iraq, you know, believed all of those uh, bullshit stories about um, Iraq and uh, war on terror being synonymous with each other. How would a responsible major uh, media entity have developed strategies to reduce that level of um, disinformation? Mm -hmm. Well, on the WMD issue, um, it's really no surprise that in the face of um, international inspections, or our own <laughs> teams going to uh, try to find these weapons, that, um, that the public um, believed that such weapons existed uh, and, in fact, even had been found. And the reason they did is that it was clearly intimated by the administration and those in favor of the war. And they continued, in the face of the absence of these weapons, to say that the matter was still unresolved and that there certainly were, uh, there was partial evidence and we'd have to wait. I mean, so that's where they got the impression that weapons either were there or, or remained to be found because it was being suggested by, uh, not only by the president and the vice president, although he was a leader in this department, but in those wishing to justify the war. And so that, that was the, uh, I, I believe, is a partial explanation uh, for why they, a percentage of the public continues to believe that in, in, um, in the face of all evidence to the contrary. And what was the earlier point, Steve? What can the media do to counteract that perception? I think that was, wasn't that? Well, was, no, the first part, Steve. The first part. Well, okay, the, the, yeah, actually you haven't answered the question, which was how would uh, the media develop a responsible right. strategy to address that level of, of uh, incomprehension or whatever. And the first part had to do with why with the, did... With, the, with the, the, the way the, the audiences for Bush's campaign were self-selected. Yes. Oh, was, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me go to that for a moment. The, um, it's a, it is a not 
uh, entirely original technique that this administration has raised to a level I, I have never heard of. Um, the president travels in a bubble that is not just security. He goes to events where tickets are issued and only to the Republican faithful and only even nowadays on this little campaign on Social Security to those who agree with him on Social Security. And then up on the stage next to him sits Mrs. So-and-so who is convinced that this is a terrific idea and will interact with him. Uh, it's, it's part of a strategy of building support. You want to have coverage of these events, or sats as they may be, uh, in which there appears to be uh, support. Look at that hall full of people. They're all applauding. Must be a great idea. And so it, it's incredibly simplistic. It's insulting to the intelligence of the larger audience, but it is a rather tried and true political technique, in, and it, it's used generally during campaigns. Uh, now it's being used generally. Uh, as a as a mo for presidential events, certainly as a result, the president never hears any criticism. I am convinced the reason that uh, George W. Bush was so off his uh, game in the first debate, when John Kerry came out very aggressively, going after him, accusing him of, of lying and distorting and so forth. Um, <coughs> You know, presidents don't hear that. He had gone four years of uh, constant applause ringing in his ear. And uh, so they just don't hear it. And he was clearly taken aback. Well, he found his feet in the second and third debates. But, uh, but it, was, it was very striking to me in the first. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, as to, uh, uh, the as to how the media is supposed to persuade the public that black is black and not white. Uh, in the face of this kind of uh, thing, I don't know what you can do, but keep reporting it and, uh, and hope that you get through. Well, you could imagine a uh, responsible network refusing to cover a, a, a staged event that was, that was a circus. Well, they do. They don't, I mean, look, they go out and they cover the first two or three of those, and, and then the coverage drops off uh, sharply. I want to thank the audience and thank the speakers.